we, c we can also make it, you know, like a surprise. Uh. Yeah, should we do a surprise <laughs> drop? <laughs> All right, so, uh, so this is fun. The, the cameras are rolling, so it's going to be a, a real interview. <sighs> surprise. First surprise. one for Sam. I mean, uh, we can also yeah, make yeah. it whatever works. <laughs> what, what's your opinion on the inclusion of electric bikes to increase the distance mm -hmm. uh, radius for traveling? Okay. Shall I do this in English so that you can... Yes, yes, please. Step in if you... Vale? <laughs> so, um, I think uh, e-bikes, they're, they're actually quite popular in the Netherlands now. There's like, um, I think it's around 25%, mm -hmm. right, of all bikes? Uh, which are, actually, is it more? By, by price. Which by are being... Oh, okay. It's more than half now, the sales. By price. By price, but, so, yeah. But, um, and we're seeing that they're being used, especially... Um, Outside of uh, outside of city centres, um, so actually the Netherlands, of course, it's a very urban country, but it's also it's quite dispersed in a way. There's lots of you know like towns one near each other, uh, with sort of semi-rural but not quite rural. So in that sense, the the bike then becomes this very helpful tool, um, and of course, it's also helped by the fact that you know that cycling infrastructure it also works it's not only in the city centers but in general so i think that's the the main advantage um they're also quite good for older people it sort of it allows them to continue cycling when they would have stopped um but then within city centers you have this debate especially with these speed pedelecs mm -hmm. you know all about them um which are basically, they go too fast, so then how do you deal with those? Yeah, they go actually um, 45 I don't know, what are, your thoughts? what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, this, this <laughs> e-bike question is really interesting. Mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to deal with it, and they mm -hmm. don't quite know how, really, because uh, right now, they're currently, for the very fast e-bikes, they've got license plates on them, and they have to actually go on the, the street and not the bike path. Um, yeah, which which is which is rather weird, right? Because uh, it, you don't feel any less vulnerable; you're just going faster. Um, and in the mission of protecting other cyclists, where right, I find it's interesting that perhaps we are putting these uh, these types of bikes going 45 kilometers an hour not quite fast enough to keep up with traffic, uh, because going 45 is actually really scary. Mm -hmm. And research shows that the speed pedelec users, in theory, they can go that fast, but they don't keep that speed. Um, so mo their average speed is much lower. As opposed to normal e-bikes that go 25 kilometers an hour, uh, their, their average speed is closer to their top speed. Right, so people are actually using that, that speed and power. Ha. <laughs> Nice and broad. Uh -oh. <laughs> what actions can be implemented to switch cities traditionally car-based to a bike-based system? Ooh, contentious. I'm going to get in trouble on the internet now, no matter what I say. <laughs> uh, so I think, I think it, it's, you, you Sam, mm -hmm. gave, a, gave a, a story of incremental change, mm -hmm. even in place like the Netherlands. And, uh, and we saw a graph about how it, in the Netherlands still, it's an automobile-dominated society. 27% uh, mode share by bikes is uh, quite far beyond the, the next country, which is Denmark. They're at 20. Uh, but it, that means that most of the kilometers traveled, right? Not trips, mm -hmm. but kilometers yeah. traveled is still up in the 80% range by car, right? So most by car, a bit by train, and then very few by any other mode because cars travel longer. So, um, so in, if you view it that way, you know, bikes are actually quite a small proportion. How do we then change the system with this in mind? Um, I think uh, starting in urban areas is, is a good bet. I think uh, increment, I would say, Sam wrote a paper about space and, and speed, mm -hmm. right? So we, we have to think in these terms about our cities. I would say conquer the space first. Even like even if it's free and you, you put paint on the road, it doesn't cost anything. It only costs political will and perhaps some very angry people. Right? But once <laughs> you get thing. that space, mm -hmm. then you have um, a platform on which you can actually invest money into. Right? So you can always upgrade, right? Upgrade and then that becomes a cost issue uh, that's independent from the politics at that point. 
Right, so once you gain the space, then you can incrementally make it better. Perhaps just to elaborate on which I, I think you will be presenting on if you have time, but of course, one of the things we discussed earlier was this idea that you know, if you have a very sprawled city, well, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> going to be difficult to cycle in. So in this sense, that, that makes it difficult to switch to a, to a, to a completely cycling-based system. But then we need to start thinking about the combination of cycling plus public transport and, and mainly sort of train, train, train transit. Um, because then you know you have the cycling to the station and then mm. and then taking public transport and then that can become a, a, a good alternative to to car trips but you know the, the bike on its own it, it will never manage but if, if we combine it with the train then yeah it stands a, a much better chance I agree. <laughs> am I doing it you're doing it I know I'm doing it when odds are against you from a sociological, Ooh. cultural, infrastructural, was and, yeah. geographical <laughs> <laughs> and geographical perspective, how do you incorporate alternate modes of transportation to society? Perhaps there's a, a, a good clarification question because we have cycling, but then we have cycling crossed out, and then we have alternative modes of transportation uh, okay, highlighted. Being, being <laughs> so politically sensitive. Does the group <laughs> want to elaborate on? Yeah, do they mean cycling or do they mean other things as well? Well, I think that sometimes cycling is not the best option mm -hmm. to incorporate mm -hmm. another type of transportation, so that's why we changed. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and actually, that's that's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Is uh, is sometimes the, cycling isn't it isn't isn't the the best mode for for the context. It's it's one of a mix of solutions, and uh, and just because we're Urban Cycling Institute, <laughs> we research cycling. That you know, we, we shouldn't. We should always keep in mind that mm -hmm. the, the the best solution is not that like, if everything's a what is it the nail and the hammer thing. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. So I think some <laughs> cycling advocates, especially, get into that mentality where everything they have bicycles and everything can be solved by that. But I think as academics, as we do our research, we we see the full complexity of of the network and and really. Uh, I think the direction is going towards uh, how do we combine modes and, and, and uh, integrate the system, make the system work better. Uh, what are some good public transport cities, for example? Asian cities. Yeah, lots of Asian <laughs> cities, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think that, that's a good example. Or, or Germany, but uh, is that someone knocking? No, I know. Um, yeah, like uh, lots of these Asian cities. So, so I'm, mm -hmm. I was born in Beijing. And, uh, and they actually, you know, Beijing as a city moved from a, a cycling city, really, back in the 90s, uh, until now, which mm -hmm. uh, they are now basically a public transport city, with the government investing heavily in public transport. Although, you can see, see at the same time, they're putting the people underground and they're putting the cars on the surface, right? So huge billions mm -hmm. and billions in subway, but, um, but they're putting, uh, the, the people who are, who are taking these subways underground and the surface level has been expanded to accommodate more car traffic. So it's, it might be a devious scheme, you know, it might be the cars mm -hmm. winning in this case, marketed as uh, a mm -hmm. huge public transport investment. Uh, but, and just to, so you talk about Beijing, you being mm -hmm. born there, I'm from Barcelona, so <laughs> that's also perhaps interesting, again, to, to highlight your point that, you know, cycling is, is not necessarily always this goal, you know, like, Cycling is good because it does other things, but you know it's not necessarily the, the goal in itself. Is like um, in Barcelona, the the modal share, so that means you, the, the percentage of, of trips over a certain transport mode. It's it's much more walking oriented. It's like half of the trips are walking, um, and of course, the minute you start encourage cycling, it's all very well. But um, but at some level, that is going to come at the cost of walking, probably more than car use because ultimately cycling it tends to compete much more with uh, with walking but also with with public transport mm -hmm. um, so in, in this sense there is there is this trade-off which needs to be taken into account um, just um, last week I was I was in Germany and yeah the Germans they're so good at their public transport <laughs> which at, at some level does go a bit against the cycling um, but one of the things also in Amsterdam is that it's got it's got an okay public transport, but it's it's kind of okay. 
<laughs> and and that that is also yeah that, that is also an explanation um and you sort of yeah you have to decide what kind of city you you want to be in depending on you know the the sort of your tradition the the look of the city the amount of money you have um it's all kinds of all right next one's a doozy <laughs> Uh, a short but complicated one. Okay. How does the government encourage or deal with clean transportation? Uh, who wrote this question? <laughs> uh, by the government, Audio. you mean uh, Dutch. Amsterdam situ uh, Dutch situation? Yeah. Okay, so how does okay. the Dutch government? And by ordeal, oh. we mean. Ordeals. Ordeals. Yeah, like how yeah. does it. How does the mm -hmm. government go into this equation? Like, is there some kind of incentive or tax, or like currently, or is it mm -hmm. just literally just like a social thing that people just do? Or maybe the tax per car is really high. Okay, in that sense. I don't know how mm -hmm, mm -hmm. go into, fit into this. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, of course, there's all the planning, but apart from the, the physical planning, um, yeah, owning a car in Amsterdam is not the cheapest. Um, and here, the, the typical measure, which is the one which works best or, or is the easiest one to implement for local governments often is, is parking, right? Um, so, so car parking. Um, the minute you, you start restricting car parking, well, yeah, I mean, people will have to, they'll have to figure out some, some other kind of alternative. So, so in a, a big part of central Amsterdam, and even not so central, there's there's a, a permit system. So you need a you need to apply for a parking permit. You need to pay. I think it depends on the neighborhood. But I think it's like three four hundred euros a year, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, the Dutch are quite rich, so it's not that much for them. But it's it's still it's still quite a bit. And sometimes there's a waiting list. Um, so so in that sense, yeah, um, th there is all of that in place. Of course, how do you how do you get that in a city which doesn't have all of that? I think that's the interesting question. Again, I, I'd say probably the best way is to sort of, you know, go for the gradual approach, you know, or parking costs 20 euros a year, next year it costs 40. And <laughs> of course, all of that means it, it takes a while. But, um, but yeah, ultimately it is, it is a question of political will and sort of how much can you, can you force the system before you start getting sort of lots of negative pushback, I think. Oh. All right, oh, shall we, uh, we, can, we can do a few more. You guys yeah. enjoying this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Uh, l let us know when you want me to go back to a presentation. We'll probably mm -hmm. do uh, another 10 minutes. Yeah, I think we, we have time if we uh, sort of like bang, bang. Yeah, okay. Okay, a fun one. Um, well, how to optimize parking space for bikes in overpopulated cities? How to optimize I mean, parking what space to do for when, bikes? Yeah. Well, um, when you're going to Utrecht, are you going to go see the big parking garage under the train station? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Okay, <laughs> great. Nice. It's going to be fun. It's also a great, anyone skateboard in here? Yeah. Uh, yeah? Okay, it's, it's, it's really fun in there with a skateboard. Um, but, but you'll get in trouble for it. So don't do it, but it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, this bike parking situation, I think uh, there's, there's so much demand, especially around train stations, that, uh, that par bike parking is in this odd place of being a commodity. Uh, it it's takes up less space than cars, but it's still taking up space. And if you're in the city center, you know, space is very valuable. Um, so it, it, now we get into the, the question of how do, we, how do we encourage sustainable transportation? which in uh, any normal context, you know, would be, let's put as much free bike parking as possible mm -hmm. to this context where it's competing with walking space, it's competing with living space. Um, at the train station, really, it's, it's competing with, um, with uh, also the environmental quality of an area, right? So if you step out of Amsterdam Central Station, it, it's, it's bikes everywhere. And, uh, and bike parking does have a cost somehow we don't know exactly what the cost is because there's all these factors that go into it but you know the pricing of bike parking that gets tricky and uh, <laughs> uh you know like it, it, there's there's do you price it even though it's good for the environment or, or do, do you do you price it 
um, you know, just because it, it's scarce and you want to improve accessibility. Because bike parking is no good when all of it is mm -hmm. full, right? And that, that's the situation we run into. And then the government has to deal with overspill. Mm -hmm. They have to like take all these bikes away to the bike depot. They have to go and pay them to get your bike back. So it, it's a tough, it's a tough mm -hmm. choice. Do you yeah. have any thoughts on that? Well, one, one thought is that up to a point, at least it, I would say it is self-regulating or, or partially self-regulating in the sense, and this is something which, which definitely happens in, in Amsterdam, um, which is often, you know, you want to go to like the central station or um, for example, a neighborhood which, which often like the pipe, it's also mm -hmm. very, you know, it's always very tightly packed with bikes. And then what you often do is you, you park your bike sort of further away and you end up walking, right? For the last five, 10 yeah. minutes. Um, so in, in this sense, I mean, people aren't stupid. Um, some of them are, <laughs> but most people, you know, if there's, if there's no bike for the bikes there, like they know they will park it a bit further away. Of course, then the, the risks you're, or the risks uh, you're, you're encountering is that then fewer people will bike, right? Because you're, you're, you're not actively sort of making things as, as easy as possible. Um, yeah, but then it's, it is this, this trade-off you say, right? Do you yeah. start pricing as well? Do you start? I don't know, it's contentious. Do you, uh, do you want to pick one to ask us? Since you're right here in the front, we got, we got four questions. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking and, there's, uh, I've, I've seen there's a couple which can perhaps yeah? be remixed okay. because they're, they're quite in a similar, we'll, we'll they're in you, a similar direction. We'll give you 30 seconds. <laughs> Yeah, they're pretty similar, right? Okay. <laughs> you put him on the spot I'm now. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I think the cultural shift is, mm -hmm. okay. is one. Ask us loudly so everyone okay. can hear you. So what is the best way to start cultivating the culture of using bicycles in society? Okay, I can yeah. give it a okay. go. <laughs> yeah, and, and that one's also very similar to, to another one which you had, no? Which was... Um, also, yeah, how to persuade people to use bikes when they have unfavorable conditions of security, infrastructure, and culture. Oh. So, so again, I mean, it, it's, it's all in the same direction. I'd say then here the question is, I mean, of course, you can't, you can't easily change culture, or whatever that is, from one day to the next. Um, but of course, you, you can change the infrastructure <laughs> in a way. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know, that won't be enough, but it is, it is the most logical point to start with. That is why cities start with that. Um, and it's all, I think, at, at a first level, it's all about creating the necessary conditions. So that, that's an interesting point. It doesn't mean that suddenly everyone will start cycling, but it, it's just simple. Uh, you know, if the basics in terms of security, safety, they're not in place, well, stuff won't happen. Um, but of course, how, how to get beyond that, I think um, the key for me is to really think um, from the perspective of people's daily lives. Um, so, you know, your average person, is, is cycling going to make sense from the, from the daily life perspective? Like, often the problem with cycling planning is that it tends to be this kind of slightly airy fairy, you know? Oh well, yeah, just plan the infrastructure, or yeah, just do a, a program of like behavioral incentives, blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, I mean, is cycling the best way to go and you know buy groceries to take your children to the um, to school? Well, in Amsterdam, for for lots of people, it is. Um, but you need, in order to be able to do that, you really need to understand the way that sort of yeah your average citizen moves around. Um, yeah, it's it a bit of a generic answer, but uh, <laughs> you mentioned uh, the soft measures, uh -huh. these yeah. cultures, these soft measures are being more difficult to change than, mm -hmm. than these physical things, right? I, I find that interesting because in my head, right, you may disagree. Well, yeah. no, 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 in my head, right, culture is uh -huh. is something that's malleable. It's not physical, so you think it, it would be easy. It like like mm -hmm. just just as like upgrading software in a computer, yeah. you know, like if we do that analogy, but. Uh, but but it's I don't think it's a correct analogy, um, and and oftentimes it is like you said the hardware that's that's ironically easier even though it costs money it, it like it ang makes people angry you know when, when they see physical change, but culture that's that's tough to research 
that's tough to change and it's really tough to understand on a different context, right?